Hello and welcome to another video with the Bearded Tech Guy. In this video, I will be going over a smart home project I've been working on for a bit of time now, and that is to make my backyard gate smart. Having a smart fence gate allows me to not only know if it's opened or closed, but also use it within several home automations I have that run throughout the day. I'll be covering what I do to make my gate smart for only the cost of a contact sensor and some Tic Tacs, as well as go over some of the major automations I have set up that actually take advantage of my smart gate. The major roadblock for this project is getting a contact sensor that can be outside. For my use case, I do not plan to need the contact sensor installed during the winter, so I do not need anything too crazy, just something that can keep moisture out and a way for the device to not get too hot. If I needed this during the winter, I think I would probably run into some issues with the contact sensor being battery powered. I did find some solutions that involved a magnetic contact that could be outside that was then run to a Zigbee or Z-Wave contact sensor, but I did not want to run a cable all along my fence. I also found a few enclosure type solutions that could be purchased or 3D printed, but they were either too expensive or too bulky for where I wanted to have the contact sensors. I also want this to be as hidden as possible so a giant enclosure doesn't really fit the bill here for me. Unfortunately, at the start of this project, all of the SmartThings contact sensors were sold out, and any of the other contact sensors I was familiar with were a bit too pricey or a bit too large for my liking. Luckily I saw a video on the LinkedIn contact sensors over on Bud's Home Automation and Repair channel and decided to pick up a pair to try out. The sensors are very small and have worked well so far for my application. The sensors are Zigbee and run off of a watch battery. The sensors will not automatically work with SmartThings, but are pretty easy to get working with an already configured device handler. I had originally purchased a 2-pack for $20, but it appears they have raised their prices to $28 for the 2-pack, which means that each sensor is only $14. To add the contact sensor into SmartThings, you'll first go through scanning for new devices like you would for any other device. Once your hub is scanning, you can remove the battery spacer from the sensor. It will take a few moments, but the contact sensor will show up as a thing. If you go to the Devices section in the SmartThings app, you'll quickly discover that you cannot actually interact with the device. Next, you'll need to go into the SmartThings IDE and navigate to the contact sensor just added. After, the device type will need to be edited to either SmartSense Multi-Sensor or SmartSense Open-Close Sensor. I actually tried out both for several months and did not notice any difference in performance or functionality. So I recommend picking the open-close option as the multi-sensor shows a few extra attributes that are not actually populated within the app for this device. With the device type changed and updated in the SmartThings IDE, the last step is to repair the contact sensor. To do this, start the adding a new device process in the SmartThings app again, and then use the reset pin to hold down the reset button for roughly 5 to 10 seconds. Once the sensor starts flashing red, you can release the button. The contact sensor will take a few moments to repair with the hub. But once it's done, you can interact with it just like any other device you have added. The new device handler also runs locally on the SmartThings hub, which is nice, and will allow for the contact sensor to be included in automations and other smart apps. The sensor also works with a HubTap hub by adding them like a normal Zigbee device. No need to change any device types or anything like on SmartThings. Just start Zigbee pairing on HubTap, remove the battery spacer from the sensor, and wait for the sensor to be discovered. With the sensor picked out and set up, the next step was making it so it could actually last outside for more than a few days or weeks. As I mentioned previously, there are a few commercial options you can buy for an enclosure and a few 3D print file options available, but everything I saw was too bulky for my liking. Instead, what I ended up doing was using an empty Tic Tac container flipped upside down. The hard plastic shell is perfect for keeping rain out, and not too thick to interfere with the magnet for the contact sensor. And with basically being free, if this idea didn't pan out, I wasn't going to lose out on any money, which is always nice. To mount the Tic Tac case, I found a 3D model for a Tic Tac mount that would normally be used to hold actual Tic Tacs on a pegboard. Because of how I was using this though, I had to make a few adjustments for the wider top of the Tic Tac container to fit through. I also needed to make the opening a bit smaller because the container I had was actually smaller than the one that the model was for, as well as make the holes for screws a bit larger for the screws that I have. After my first print, I decided that having the bottom of the holder in the middle and with how things were spaced out gave a bit too much wiggle room for the container which I didn't like so I instead moved the mount holder over to one side and duplicated it for the other side. This provides stability and adds more mounting flexibility for use in different situations. I then used the same 3D model for the magnet. This time I made the holder itself a lot smaller to accommodate my contact sensor magnet, as well as added a second ring to the middle to make sure it didn't move around too much. I also stuffed a few of the smaller dry packs I keep to help my filament stay dry to help prevent any moisture from getting to the contact sensors if any happened to get into the case for any reason. This also acts as a way to keep the contact sensors in place within the container. Next is mounting everything. Before mounting, I highly recommend taking your contact sensors to where you plan to mount and testing out the connection to the rest of your smart home network. If the contact sensor reports its status accurately and without too much delay, then you should be fine. This was the case for my first fence location due to my hub actually being very close to the spot. For the other gates I ended up doing later, I found that the signal was very weak and the device status was very unreliable. 
For this I had to install a device that repeated the Zigbee signal. The easiest way to do this is to find a plug-in Zigbee outlet that acts as a repeater and plug it in as close as possible to the contact sensor. I luckily had a spare one lying around with an outlet close enough by. Another option could be a wall switch as well if you have a light switch close enough. Every fence is a little different and for my fence I have two different locations to mount either on the top or bottom of the fence. The top is easier to deal with in my case but the bottom provides more protection from rain and sun. For now I decided to install it at the top section of my fence because when I started this I wasn't really sure how well this would work. I installed the sensor itself behind the post so that way it was out of the way. There isn't a lot of room here and I was hoping to use my 90 degree angle adapter but it was a little too big for this area. Luckily because of the mount being on the side and not in the middle I was able to angle a screwdriver enough to get the screws in. To put the container itself in I removed the lid from the bottom of the container and put the container into the mount. I then put the lid back through the bottom of the mount. I can wiggle the container through with the lid on, but it puts a bit of stress on the mount, so instead I just remove the lid. The first few tries are a bit awkward, but I got the hang of it pretty quickly. With the sensor mounted, I lined up where the magnet needed to sit and mounted its holder onto the fence. With being out in the open, it was a lot easier to mount and putting the magnet in the holder is also super simple compared to the contact sensor itself. The magnet does not need a special container because it has no electronics and it is already sealed. I probably should have removed the mounting sticker on the back of it, but it actually helps keep it snug in the mount. Testing out the fence, it reports pretty quickly if it is opened or closed. At times, it does seem a bit delayed, but nothing too crazy, and for my application, this won't cause any issues for me. Next up is setting up the automation piece for this, which will actually have a few different actions that will take place when certain things occur. All of this will be accomplished within WebCore and with some help from If This Then That. First is having an audible notification when my back door is opened while the gate is open during the day. The backyard gate is open. The backyard gate is open. Originally I'd set up CastWeb API for sending text to speech to my Google Home devices, but when I fired up the Raspberry Pi I had set up for it, it was not working. I then spent a little time looking at other options. I even set up Home Assistant to send text to speech to my Google Homes, but everything was a bit too much work for what I wanted to have accomplished. I also didn't really want yet another thing I have to maintain all the time. Luckily for me, I already have a Hubitat Hub setup that happens to also be able to run WebCore and it was very straightforward to set up text-to-speech for Google Home natively on the Hub. So I set up the Google Home integration with Hubitat and used that for my Audible notifications, which you will touch on in just a few moments. To set up the Audible notification automation, I created an if statement for if the back door is open, if it's between 7 a.m. and 10 p.m., and if the backyard gate is open to then send an external request to my other WebCore instance that is running on my Hubitat Hub. I then created a new piston on my Hubitat WebCore instance that is triggered when the external request is received from my SmartThings WebCore instance. The piston itself is just having a few select Google Homes change their volume, speak, and then lower their volume. The WebCore to WebCore communication actually works really well, and I've not had any issues because of it since setting it up for the SmartFence project. Getting the WebCore to WebCore communications working though has opened me up for a few more project ideas I want to do. Back to my SmartThings WebCore piston, I created a second if statement for if it's 5 minutes before my lawnmower is going to start cutting the grass, and the backyard gate is closed. This one is pretty straightforward because the lawnmower starts at 9pm every day, so I just have a timer set for every day at 8.55pm. If the gate is closed, then a notification is sent to my phone. With it being later in the day, I opted to not have an audible notification sent. I also created a third if statement that will send a notification if the backyard gate is closed when the mower starts cutting grass. To do this, I take advantage of the integration between WebCore and if this then that. Because of the integration, I'm able to trigger pistons within WebCore, and I can also use WebCore to trigger applets with an if this then that. With this integration, I have set up several triggers that are sent to WebCore that occur when my auto mower changes its state. Anytime my mower starts mowing, starts charging, has an error, or enters any of its other possible states, I have a trigger sent to WebCore for use. Right now I'm only using one of these states for any automations, but I have other ideas I'd like to get working. After installing the first contact sensor, I realized I'd like to know if my gates were open or not, as well as using the state of the gate in automations. So because of that, I ended up installing the same solution on two other gates. Installation was basically the same for both, just the position of where they were installed is different. One of the additional gate contacts is on the gate that leads to my pool equipment. With this contact sensor, I have a notification sent two hours after the gate was opened to remind me to shut off the pool equipment if I happen to forget to do so already. I normally remember, but there have been a few times that I got busy with something else, and the reminder has been great. The three sensors have been installed for several months now, and have been working flawlessly. I've had several very hot days, and even more days that were just a constant downpour. 
And by downpour, I mean a lot of rain. And by a lot of rain, I mean no really, a lot of rain. So far though, I have not had any issues with any of the containers, and it doesn't seem like any moisture has gotten in either. I also think the battery usage has been consistent for being outside and running hotter than they normally would as well. An automation I would like to set up at some point is if my gate is open and high gusts of wind are detected, to then generate an alert to let me know it might be a good idea to close my gate. Unfortunately, that requires my Tempest Weather Station to have SmartThings integration, which was promised at the launch of the product, but it still hasn't materialized. Hopefully someday. Overall, I'm very happy with how these have turned out so far, and I will be planning on putting them back up next spring. I think I will most likely leave the 3D printed mount attached to the fences, but take the sensor and tic-tac containers inside for the winter. It will also be a good idea to remove the batteries from them as well during this time. Between the time of starting this project and making of this video, I found out that the zoos actually released new 700 series contact sensors that you can also purchase an outdoor container for. I have purchased one to check out, but they are a bit more expensive compared to the cost of the LinkedIn contact sensors, so that will be something to keep in mind if you do decide to take on this project yourself. I will have links in the description below for all the different things I needed for this project, along with a link to the STL files if you want to print your own. I would also love any ideas for improvement or to hear about other possible solutions for the Smart Fence project, so make sure to let me know in the comments below. If you liked this video or found it helpful, make sure to give it a thumbs up so YouTube knows they should show it to other people. And if you aren't already, consider subscribing to the channel and enabling notifications to be one of the first to know when I release other home automation videos just like this one. Thank you very much for watching.